morning. This passage comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loves us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For the grace you have been saved through faith and that not yourself, it is the gift of God, not the works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Uh, so, uh, that's our passage for today, Ephesians chapter uh, 2. If you have a Bible, Ephesians chapter 2, thank you for reading uh, that uh, this morning. And I don't know about you, I've already been blessed by uh, the worship and uh, just by everything of today. And I'm excited to uh, spend some time in God's Word uh, this morning. My, my goal is to go a little shorter today because of the kids and uh, I say we should have kids in here every week, uh, but that's the goal for today. And, um, and so kids, I forgot to mention this, but we have some note uh, papers for you, and we have some papers for you in the back and some uh, crowns or crayons or however you say them, um, and some stickers there. And so uh, that's supposed to keep you busy, and you can draw a picture of me, try to spike my hair, and, um, and then, man... I'm really getting annoyed of this thing. Uh, but it's, it's my fault too. But um, afterwards, I'll be in the lobby and um, I have some candy bars for you, kids, if you want to come and show me your paper and we'll give you some candy. Um, and so make sure you fill those out the best you can or scribble on them a little bit. Uh, that's for kids. That is, uh, that's, I think it's fifth grade and below, guys. Uh, and so, sorry, Luke. But um, <laughs> we'll be good. Uh, so Ephesians chapter uh, 2. Now let me tell you a little bit about uh, this Sunday, what we call Serve Sunday, uh, and what Serve Sunday is not. Serve Sunday is not Guilt Sunday. A serve Sunday is not force everybody here to pick a topic and put it in the, and put it in the thing. Uh, sir, and like I said, it's not a desperation cry either. Uh, but Serve Sunday is simply, hey, let's look at what God uh, has done for us and how he's called us to serve. Whether that be here in this local assembly, whether that be uh, in your homes, whether that be with your family, uh, whether that be at your workplace or wherever that may be, uh, that what Christ has done for us should move us to a lifestyle of service in everything we do for his kingdom and for his glory and for his honor. And so that's what this Sunday is really all about. Galatians 5.13 says this, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty... Only do not use that liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And I love this passage of scriptures because Galatians will say that we've been given liberty in Jesus. We have, we have liberty in Christ, but don't use that liberty to live a life in sin, uh, but through love serve others. Verse 16 of that passage will say, uh, will tell us to walk in the Spirit and walk after the Spirit. And I love that word through because that word through means uh, through the channel of. It means that you're going through a certain channel and that channel is, is God's love for you. That channel is what Christ has done for, for us should move us and motivate us to a lifestyle uh, of serving God because of how he's loved us and because of the liberty that he now gives us in Christ, and, and, and I love that. It's such a powerful in, emphasis. And, and wouldn't that change what we did if we lived in that light? If everything we did, we viewed it through the channel of God's love for us? Because God 
loved me, so now I love others. Because God loved me, so now I serve others. And we did things through that channel of, of God's love for us that would uh, drastically move us. And so that's why this Sunday is not about a guilt, but it's about, hey, what can we do and what has Christ done that we can uh, channel our love to serve others, whether here or whether around our community, but for the glory of God in all things. The word love here is, is agape love. And we spoke a little bit about agape love a few weeks ago, and it's, it's Christ. <clears throat> like love. It's the love that God demonstrated to us in Romans, that while we were sinners, he died for us. It's the love in 1 John 3, that, that he says God has loved us with his lavish love, with his uh, ultimate agape love. And love, this agape love isn't uh, what you say, it's how you live. It, it's, 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 it's proved by your actions. And it has nothing to do with uh, what they do for you, it has everything to do with who you, uh, why you do what you do through the glory of God. And so I love that. And so uh, agape love is always proven not by what it says, but by what it does. And so we're called to serve through that channel. Have you ever done something out of obligation and not out of love? I remember in my past dating relationships through high school and early on in college, I uh, was not the best at giving gifts. And it's not because I was overly selfish, but it was because I'm very insecure about the gifts that I give. Uh, because I'm just not a good, even at the grocery store, she'll be like, pick up some peanut butter. I'm like, but which kind? Because uh, I don't know, I don't want to, like, even picking up Riley's gift, like, I have no clue if you like any of that stuff. But I just took a chance and rolled the dice. You're leaving anyways. Like, what? What's the matter, right? <laughs> but... I'm just, I, I, I went to the store two times just for her gift because I'm like, I don't know what to get. I just don't know. And so I'm just not very good. And so through dating relationships early on, I got into uh, this rotation of gifts, which tells you kind of the person that I was early on uh, because I couldn't keep a girlfriend. Uh, but, uh, and so I had this rotation of gifts. So every time we had a Christmas together for the first time, guess what you got? A Build-A-Bear with the same jersey and the same bear as the last one. Uh, kiss the heart, put it in there, give that out a couple times. I may have to go to a cord list. Um, we go to a, uh, then we had some other gifts throughout the year, and then uh, if we made it to that one year anniversary, you got the same necklace from Kohl's, right? Because the first one liked it, and I'm going to try to steal Brett's mic because my pop. Hello. Woo, I like this one. All right, here we go. Oh, we'll try this. Sorry about that. But I just wasn't very good at giving gifts. <laughs> and so uh, I remember when I started dating my now wife, Tesslin. I started thinking, and, and we d started dating, what, June, July, or something like that. And so Christmas was the first big holiday. I remember going to my friends and be like, guys, do I get her the bear? Right? Hey? Uh, <laughs> do I get the bear? And I was like, no, I can't do that. To she, this one feels a little bit different. And so before you label me as a jerk because of just the rotation of gifts, this one was different, and for this one, uh, I said, you know, we're going to be gone for 15 days. I went away from college. She lived near the college, and so I was going home for 15 days, so I'm going to do a 15 days of Christmas, and so every day, she's going to get a gift from me, right? And so before you label me as a jerk for, you know, just giving multiple of the same, I, I made up for it, and so kids, if you want to dab me a little bit right now, because that, I felt like the man, and I really felt like that. So it starts small, and then it get better and better throughout the course of the time together. But what was the difference? One, I gave out of obligation, and the other one I gave out of love, out of genuine care. And that's the difference, and that's the channel of love that God has called us to serve out of, not out of obligation and guilt, but out of a love and devotion for who he is and what he's done in our Lives And so Ephesians 2 this morning, I love this passage because it's so personal to me because so oftentimes, even in ministry, I can get to this place where I serve out of obligation, where I serve because I feel like I have to and not because, and I can oftentimes lose sight of what God has done in my life. And Ephesians 2 will talk very little about serving, but it'll talk a lot about the motives of why we serve. And I'll talk a lot about the motives of why we do uh, what we do. And so we're going to talk a little bit about it. And, and I'm led to remember three things when I look at this passage. And we're going to try to look at it very quickly uh, this morning. The first thing I'm led to see is this, where you walked. I'm led to be reminded where we used to walk. It says this in verse 1. 
And you he made alive who are dead in trespasses, that means the acts of sin, and in your sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world and according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by the nature children of wrath just as the others. And Paul starts by emphasizing three groups of people that kind of sums us all up. He says this. He says, you, meaning the Gentiles at Ephesus. He says, uh, we all, uh, em- emphasizing maybe like more like the believers. And he says, others. And what he's saying is everybody who is of this world was in this place before I came, before Christ. We were all, this is where we walked. Where, where, where do we walk? He reminds us of our condition. You were dead in sin. Verse 1. This is who you were. You were dead in your sin. Not only that, verse 2 says you were disobedient. You you were blindly following uh, just the the monotonous of this world. That's what you followed. That's how you live. You blindly followed the patterns of this world, and and you live for yourself. And not only that, verse 3 will say you live for the wrong one. You live for the wrong ruler. It says this, according to the prince of the power of the air. And he gives this sense that you kind of walked blindly and you kind of kept taking the bait that the enemy set before you. And you just kind of lived that life. That's, that's where you walked before me. And he gives this, this picture of where we used to walk. And we see some heavy reminders here. That, hey, this is who we were before Jesus. This is who we were. This is the life that we lived. Other passages will tell some other things that we were, how we walked. Uh, uh, Second Corinthians will say that we walked as blind. Romans 6 will say that we walked as a slave to sin. Romans 3 says we were lovers of darkness, and we walked as lovers of darkness. Mark 2 will say that we were sick. Luke 15 will say that we were lost. Ephesians will say that we were children of wrath. That we walked in disobedience. Ephesians 2 will say that we are strangers. Colossians will say that we were lovers and we walked as lovers to darkness. And this passage even says itself that by nature we were objects of wrath. That by, by our nature we deserved judgment. That's who we were. That's where we walked. And how heavy is that to understand that by nature... We deserve the wrath of God simply because of where we positioned ourselves, simply because of who we were, simply because of our bloodline, simply because of where we walked. That's who we were before me. And so often I have to, I have to step back and I have to picture this because so often I can serve out of a state of obligation and I have to think back of who I was before Christ ever came and saved me and this is who I was. We were, we were children of wrath. We were blind. We were slaves. And it was heavy. We were doomed what it, that's what it, this passage essentially says. Is essentially, by nature, we were doomed. We were hopeless. And that's the state in which we live because of where we walked. And if you don't know Jesus in this room, that wrath, the Bible says, is still over you. But if you know Jesus in this room, the Bible says that that wrath is no longer due to you because of the saving grace of Jesus. And that's where you walked. And, it, and it's heavy. And that's why it's so easy to do wrong and so hard to do right in this life but also why sin has a punishment. But so often it's so hard to live in a state of of following God. It's so hard to live in a state of doing right because it's so easy to do wrong. Just last week, I was with a couple and we were talking here at this church and uh, they they disciplined their kid right in front of me, which is always awkward. You're just kind of standing there as they're yelling at the kid. And um, they kind of correct, course correct, because he did something wrong and judgment was due. And literally less than 10 minutes later, the kid turns and does the very thing he got in trouble for doing. And in my head, I'm like, what are you doing, right? No, I'm trying to save your life. Don't do that. But so often, I fall into that same cycle. So often, I can read scripture every single day, and I can go out the very same moment in the very same car, uh, in, 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 in the very same house with my wife, and we can get into an argument or something can happen, and I can reject and neglect the very thing that God's word told me to do uh, because this is who we were. This is who we were before him. And the Bible indicates this. He says, hey, this is where you once walked. 
which is implying that, hey, once you're in Christ, you should no longer walk in that path. You should no longer walk in that light. He's saying, hey, this is who you once were, but it shouldn't be who you continue to be. It shouldn't be, uh, you shouldn't continue to live in the position in which you were before me because of me, that the lifeless man is comfortable in the grave, but once life is restored, he should feel very uncomfortable living among the dead. And the same thing's true in our lives. We gotta step back and remember, hey, this should not be comfortable to continue. This is who you are were before me, but then he's going to tell us in verse 4 that this is where I went for you. This is who you were before me, but secondly, this is where I went for you. It says this, but God. This is who you were, but God. But God, who's rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ, for by grace have you been saved. And he raised us up together, and he made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and that in Christ Jesus, that in the age to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace have you been saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it's a gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. And this should be an absolute game changer. That he just told us who we were. We were dead. We were hopeless. We, we were doomed. But God's mercy, but God chose to love, but he instituted his grace, and he wants to instill in us hope, a more sure hope only found in the gospel of Jesus. That should change us. That should change everything that we do. That the gospel... The good news of the gospel, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus for our salvation should change us. But the reality is, the fact is that his mercy and his grace extended to us offers us salvation. It should change who we are. This is what he did for us. They took on the cross for, for you and for me, and it should change how you live. It should change how you serve. It should change the direction and the focus that's in our eyes. It should blow us away. Not only that he would pull us out of the wrath that's due to us because of his mercy, but he would bless us as he wants to place us into the heavenly places with Jesus. That should change your life. It should change who you are. I want to help illustrate this, but that God, how he sees us dead in our sin is broken. Following the path of this world, wrath due to us, judgment due to us. But God says, hey, I think today I'm going to demonstrate my love. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show some mercy and show some grace and offer salvation to all who believe. And I want to help illustrate this this morning for the younger crowd. And so uh, I'm, I may walk around. Hopefully the mic doesn't, it doesn't go off again. But I want to demonstrate this by uh, demonstrating uh, Brett and I. You can stay seated. But Brett and I, we're, we're at lunch. We're, we're back in high school or junior high or something. And, and we're at lunch. And, and my mom did me good. She packed me a lunch. Brett doesn't have a lunch. And I don't know what happened, but so Brett's frustrated. Brett's mad. Brett's angry. Try to work with him. All right. Uh, but this, this, is, this is Brett. So I'm here. We're sitting together. And so I open up my lunch. And boy, did mama bless me. Right? I, not really. But uh, I have my lunch. And Brett's furious because Brett doesn't have a lunch. And Brett doesn't want to steal my lunch, but he doesn't want me to have a lunch. He wants me to be miserable like Brett is miserable, right? And so what Brett does is he just throws my lunch. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh. It's a little youth pastor, but a little excessive. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> that, was, that was a good one. I'm sorry. Don't leave the church. Um, and so now, now neither of us have a lunch. And so now, now, I am, now, I am, now I'm sad. He's a bully. And so now I go over here, and I cry. He's mad, I'm mad. He loses, I lose, right? But the teacher or the, the lunch lady comes, and she sees this drastic event take place. And so she gifts me with a new lunch, right? And so I open my lunch, and boy, do I have an abundance here. I have double the amount, right? This is looking good. And so I'm over here, and I'm going to enjoy my lunch, Right? And I can, I can enjoy it, and, and I can say, ha look at you over here, look at me, go eat the crumbs off the ground, you peasant. Like, I can do all that. Or, or, here, here's the difference. Mercy tells me to forgive him even though he doesn't deserve it. Mercy says, hey, forgive even though 
he doesn't even want it right now. That's what mercy says, and so I forgive. But grace says, hey, I have an abundance. Come enjoy this with me. You don't have to, but come, up, come over here. Because mercy says, hey, you're forgiven. But grace says, hey, I have something. I have enough for you. I have an abundance that I have for you. And, and that's the gospel. That's the gospel, that God would demonstrate his love for us. That while we were still actively in sin, he died. And he died not for the righteous, but to declare us righteous. He, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And, and the next phrase tells us it all. Because the next phrase will tell us uh, that in the age to come that he might show exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Why does he do this? Because he wants, to, he wants to reveal his glory through us. That's what he wants to do. He wants to reveal his glory through us. That for all of eternity, I am evidence of his grace. I'm a trophy of his grace. Uh, that that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm displaying the loving kindness of his grace. And so the gift that's been given to me should now be lived through me. It, even though he may not deserve it. Even though he may not uh, want it or appreciate it or value it. The gift that has been given to me should now be lived through me. And that was demonstrated by the cross. And so when we read, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. It makes sense because we did nothing to deserve it. And so all we can do is demonstrate it and live through it and live through the channel or the lens of grace so that he can be revealed through our lives. Because it's not of ourselves. It's all because of the gift in which we have received and should be shared with those around us. And you see, this verse has nothing to do with serving, but at the same time, it has everything to do with serving. Because it's what Christ has done for us that should motivate every area of our lives. And that's the gospel. It's mercy. And so, when people look at me and the, the event that just transpired, and when I invite him in, they say, well, that's got to be God. When people look at old Travis and uh, see him up on stage now, they, they, people have to, that has to be God. And when people look at your life, how you were and how God's worked through you, people can't help but say, that's a God thing. That's only due to the grace of God. And so the gift that's in me should now be revealed through me. And so where did he go? He went to the cross so that you could be saved. He went to the cross so that you could know him and nothing you can do can merit salvation it was totally dependent on his grace and his mercy to give it to you that's where he went it's a gift god's love's a gift god's grace is a gift god's mercy is a gift your ability to receive it is a gift salvation is a gift and we're not saved because we passed the test but because he demonstrated it to us and he offered it up for all and so that's where he went which leads me to my last point why do we serve? Verse 10 says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Who we were, we were dead in sin. Where he went, he went to the cross to redeem us. And so why do we serve? Because we're his works of art, created for good works. Created in Christ Jesus. Verse 8 through 10 will elaborate on this God's gracious gift for us by by kind of talking about works and talking about faith. And, and what we'll see is that he states salvation is truly, purely a gift, solely free gift from God. But through salvation, the evidence of that should be a lifestyle that says, Lord, I want to serve you. That, that the works are not the root of salvation, but works are actually a fruit of salvation. And so it's because, Lord, you saved me. Lord, I want to serve you. I want to live for you. I want to honor you with my life. That if we're in Christ, we belong to Christ. And so God is actually working on us, and he's working in us, so that then he can one day work through us. Because we're his workmen. We, we, we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. John 15 says this, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Why? For this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. How do you be a disciple of Jesus? Abide. You abide in Jesus, and he gives the fruit. It, it, where is workmanship? Where is work of art created for, for a higher purpose, for created for a higher calling? That means when people see my life, they should see evidence of Christ's work through me. 
shouldn't see Travis Burger. They should see how Christ is working through me because I've been created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Our lifestyle should be one that, that strives for people to see not me, but evidence of Jesus through me because we're his work of art. Jesus says it this way, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify you. No, glorify your Father which is in heaven, that they may see our good works and they'll lead them to glorify God because of his grace and mercy shining through our lives. Paul will continue and he says this, God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Chapters uh, chapters 4 through 6 will kind of lay out what these works will look like. We don't have time to elaborate all of Ephesians uh, chapter 4 through 6. But chapter 4 verse 15 and 16 says this. It says, but speaking truth and love, may, grow, may we grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, for whom the whole body joint and knit together by every joint supplies. You hear that? Every joint supplies. According to the effective working by which every part does its share. And every part causes growth to the body for the edifying of itself in love. That every joint matters. That every part has a share and that every person plays a part in the body of Christ. Everyone plays a part. Everyone has a job. 1 Corinthians 12 says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one of us for the profit of all. And I love that because it says, uh, my gift pro actually profits you and your gift actually profits me. But the opposite of that can be said true, right? If I don't do what God has called me to do and I don't use my gifts how God has called me to use, then, then the body can't function how it's supposed to. And if you don't, then the body can't function how it's supposed to either. We're the body of Christ and every joint supplies every part has a role. And I love that because it places such priority on helping each other reach their potential in Jesus. And so every kid in the room, there should be something burning inside of us that says, Lord, I want, I want to play a part. I want to help that kid reach their potential in Jesus because I want to reach my potential in Jesus. I want to help that teenager reach their potential in Jesus because I want to help myself and the body of Christ reach their potential in Jesus. I want to help that married person or that single person or that elderly person finish strong because I want the body of the Christ to function how it's ought to because I want to be who God has called me to be. And so I need the body to be who God has called it to be because every joint supplies. Have you ever seen a dog after surgery with one of those cones on? Anyone ever seen that? I went to the store this week to buy one of those, and they're very expensive, and so I did not buy them, but I made one, and so don't make fun of me. Um, I, I'm a little illustration heavy today, and that's just because we had kids in the room, and so I'm trying my hardest to keep them awake. Um, and, uh, and so I have one more illustration, and it's just a silly illustration, but, and I spilled coffee on it this morning. And so, it, but this is the best I could do. And so here I'm going to have, who did I have come up? You want to come up here uh, for me? He's going to come up here. And the reality is, is this. You can just stand right there uh, for me. The reality is this. This is created for a good thing for dogs, right, or, or cats or whatever you have. Um, th that this will shield them from if they have stitches or it hurts, they can't lick it or, or do whatever they do. I'm not really that sure. Uh, but uh, when I put this on, which I did put this on, it, it drastically hinders my ability to see, right? I, I put it on, I stood right here early this morning, and, and I couldn't see uh, to the sides. I couldn't really see these sections over here because it drastically shaped my ability to see. And so I want you to put this on uh, for me real quick. H how's, it, how's it feel? Does it, does it hinder your ability to see a little bit? Let's put it this way. Yeah. All right. So I just want you to look out in the crowd. Can, can you see me? No. Can you see me? Okay. So it hinders your ability to see. And so here's what I want you to do for me uh, real quick. I have a pair of shoes here. And I want you to just look out into the crowd. Hello. There you go. He doesn't even need this thing. Um, I'm just kidding. But I want you to look into the crowd. And, and what I want you to do is I want you to see if you see anybody who is in need of what is in your hands. Do you see anybody who needs what is in your hands? Do you see anyone? No, you don't see anybody. Nobody? 
okay? Are you looking real hard? Okay. And see, the, the point is this. So often we can live our lives with blinders on. That so often what God has placed in our hands for us to use for his glory, we can miss what God has called us to do with what is in our hands because we have blinders that are distracting us really from the person who's right beside them. And so often what God has uh, what God has put us through and what God has allowed us to go through in our lives and what the talents and the treasures and, and the gifts that God has given you it can be just what the person needs that's right beside you, but so often we never know because we have blinders on that are distracting us from the reality that God has maybe called that purpose to because when you take off the blinders, you see that what was in his hands that God has placed in his hands was actually what was needed for the person right beside him, but he had no clue because there was blinders on. And, and so oftentimes, you can sit down. And so oftentimes, the silly illustration to define a purpose of this, that so oftentimes God has gifted us with things and given us abilities and, and placed opportunities into our hands, but so often we're living with a blinder. We're living distracted maybe for what, what will this gift, how will this gift benefit me? How will giving this time benefit me? And so often we miss the reality that it may be a blessing to the very person who's sitting next to you and you never even understand because it's all about you. And why I have to go back to Ephesians 2 from time and time again is because I need the reminder that my, my, my service isn't out of obligation, but it's not even for me, it's for, it's for Christ. And if God can use me to impact the person next to me, Lord, may you get the glory. And so there's times where I have to go back and remember who I was. I was dead in my sin. There's times I need to go forward and remember, look what you've done. Look what you've saved me from. Uh, look, look at your grace that's totally merited from you and then look forward and say, Lord, blinders off. Lord, help me serve you. Let me ask you, what are you using? How are you using your gift to serve the Lord? How are you using it? How are you using your gift? Maybe you're in here and you don't know Christ. And so you can't use your gift because you don't know Christ. You can't serve Christ until you first come to know Christ. You need to know that there's a God in heaven that loves you. And Romans says that sin is real. Sin is anything that we think, say, or do that displeases God. And the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, meaning we can't serve God, we can't even have union with God because we sin. But John says that God loves us and that he gave Jesus, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have union, have everlasting life through Jesus. You say, how? The Bible says in Romans, if you confess with your mouth and believe, you can be saved. So what do you have to do? Confess and believe. A simple prayer of obedience. Say something like, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that without you, I can never attain heaven. And so, Lord, uh, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Thank you for saving me. A confession with the mouth, a belief in the heart, and you can be saved. Maybe you're never saved. Maybe here, you need to get saved, and I would love to talk to you after the service. Maybe you're in here, and you just never made Village your home. And, and we have a class for you right after this where you can go, and you can say, hey, I want to make Village my home because I want to serve in greater ways. And maybe, maybe you just need to start serving around your community and take the blinders off and be kind to your neighbor and, and, and love your enemies and be kind to your boss and serve your boss in greater ways or serve your parent in greater ways. Maybe, maybe that's a step you need. Maybe you need more balance. Maybe you're just overwhelmed. Maybe you burn out with serving, and you, you need balance in your life. And you need to step back and say, Lord, help me not serve out of obligation, but help me serve because I love you, because of where I was, because of what you've done. And so now I cannot help but serve you with my life, whether that be here or at work or in community or at home. Lord, help me focus through the channel of love in all things. Would you pray with me? Father. I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for the ability to stop and to consider where we were. Lord, I thank you for the ability to stop and to consider where you went through the cross. Lord, if someone's in here and they don't know you, Lord, I pray that today will be the day of salvation. Oh, Lord, I thank you for showing us a picture uh, that we can do things through your love for us. 
You know, while we're still sinning, you loved us, you died for us, but now you want to live through us. And may, and may we have a heart to serve you, not just here. We don't need just more people to serve on a team. We need more people to serve you with their lives, to serve you every single day, every moment, every chance, every grocery visit, every, every conversation with a neighbor, every time they're behind the wheel. Lord, help us have a heart to serve. And Lord, it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so.